In this video, I'm going to do some things that are a little bit risky. Um, mountain biking is risky, leaving your house is risky. I say the only way to be totally safe and secure and have security is to go to prison. Now, when you're locked in, nobody can get at you. You're supervised. You're not allowed to do any kind of dangerous stuff. And even then, people get shanked. So, uh, in life, there's a lot of risks. In this video, I'm going to be taking some risks that seem really stupid. And I'm not trying to justify my behavior whatsoever. What I am saying, consider I want to be able to share a safer way to do something that's dangerous, right? So I like to fly, I like to do a lot of things that have some risk involved. And what I do is I think what's the worst that can happen and then work backwards from there. And that's what I do in this. Uh, the method that I've used, I've used a number of times and been more successful than in this one. Uh, in this video, I actually ruined the camera that I'm filming on in that I put a bunch of metal shrapnel in the lens. In this video, I'm also going to show you my favorite grinding disc. I've, done, I've used a lot of different grinding discs in a lot of different projects. I'm not Av, that guy that does the reviews on the grinders and all that kind of stuff. But I do have a significant amount of experience and the point of this video is to dispel some of that to all y'all but in such a way that I don't want to seem like I'm encouraging people to do this. Nothing is worth losing your finger. Let's do this. Ryan's Mobile One. Let's do part two of two. Probably hang on to that. I may use that for something. Let's see if we can turn this around like that. Rubber stinks. Pry or tear that open. Its inner part's not very strong compared to the outer. Kind of satisfies. That feels good. I'm just gonna try to pop that off. Slide it out. More cool looking parts. You know that I was one of the art kids in school. <laughs> kind of went away from that. The coolest thing was I got to slough school and draw at the mall. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. If art is going to make me have an opportunity to hang out and do something that I like instead of being stuck in class, then that's freaking awesome. <laughs> so I draw a hyper realistic color pencil drawings. Won some awards for sculpture on a couple different things. But anyway, there's that. Now it's really easy to see that this is out a little ways. It's not tight and binding, so we should be able to get a good grip on it. This is going to stink period uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to cut it at the barrel at the bottom and at the top in a way that it's thin enough you saw when i cut this to be thin i could break it free i'm going to do the same thing here you see the arrow it says it turns clockwise I'll always double check it i want it to go that way so i've got it where it can kick back pretty far without getting to my hand and catch it let's begin that's kicking back is important to know and that is it's getting through the soft metal and hitting the steel so it's soft 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 hard and dissimilar metal so you can expect that kick I'm limiting out because I'm hitting this against the side here but bear in mind we can rotate this around to get the other side so while I'm in this position I'm, I've got the best range of motion across here so I'm Now we're going to rotate it with the impact, and that may break it and free it up to where we're good on the bottom end. We'll just have to try and find out what happens. Nope, we are still there. So we'll rotate it around, we'll cut it some more. I was just about to say we're going to kick, <laughs> and before I could get it out of my mouth, like I'm not kidding, I was about to say that. Uh, we hit the steel and it kicked back just like I was talking about. So it's time for a new blade. I'm going to check and see. Another reason for it to kick is we are all the way through there. I think it's hanging on by a nothing. So I'm not going to bother with that. I can break that by hand or with a pry bar. 
I'm gonna put the new blade in and make my top cut. I was in there and I knew I was getting close here because there's a really well pronounced rust mark on each side of it. So I was almost through, I thought it was about to kick. The old blade that I just took off blew up. I used these just to kind of try them out. They were on sale. I don't know what to say. They just really, really work well. <laughs> They don't kick back and blow up on me the way the other ones do. Okay, let's do some more cutting on this. Slow, gentle, cautious, tightly gripping this cutting. All right, as they say, I am tickling the dragon's tail here. Let's see, the bottom should break off. Oh, it fell out. Yeah, that's on the ground. That happened when the uh, thing kicked back. You saw that happen. And getting my camera lens ruined, and we're just kind of having one of those days, I guess. Okay, some of this stuff's not an exact science. It just get her done. Okay, so that's turning really easy. That's a really good thing. Apparently, a lot of the bind was in that bottom end. That's good news. I want to turn that a little bit this way. I can do that by hand now. So much looser and easier to work with. I'm holding on to this thing unbelievably tight. I mean, if this thing were a boa constrictor, it would have respect for the strangle I'm putting on this. This is where I should have quit and hit it with a hammer. And that's the game we play, that's why we use a guard. So some of that did hit me in the shoulder, and it smarts. No big deal. Your soft pink stuff, you gotta make sure that that's all out of the way. If I was smart, I'd be wearing a jacket or some better protection than what this is. Case are off. Good thing I've got a safety t-shirt on. I just figure this is a cost of doing business. Not funny. So because of all the preparation back and forth and lube I did, I can spin this out by hand. This takes planning. It would be a shame to cut that screwdriver slot and not use it, right? So, don't use that. My forearms are really tired from holding on to that so tight. So there you have it. Use a guard on your cutter. Get your threads right so you can do this out when you're done. Let me show you what the new bolts look like. I had to go all the way to Salt Lake to get these picked up. It's about an hour each way. So I got two of them. Figure if I'm gonna need it once because I didn't have a 14 by 1.5 by 190 millimeters. I'd have another one in my bin for the next time when I do. So right now I can see that I'm a little bent. When I look at this, I can see it's a little closer to the left than the right. When I spin it in, I know the bolt's straight because it's new or it should be. But see how it's favoring that side? So I'm gonna get enough threads to where I can have a good influence on the other, I want this to be really straight so it doesn't affect the alignment. So I'm going to hit the, this part of the bolt here that way. And I'm not going to worry about it starting rusting here to the rest of it because I'm going to be using anti-seize on it when I put it back in. So everything's back in alignment from all the manipulation that we had to do to get the threads cleaned up to have it come out easy enough. I didn't have to get out the torch. and We didn't breathe too much rubber. Not too bad. Uh, Hitachi G12. Sierra Echo 2. This is the one to get. I got this because a friend, I used to work for a company doing contract work, doing expert witness evidence, cutting cars and has for court cases. And this is what he used. He was cutting a cement truck frame in half to simulate having a U-Haul hit it. That was a while ago. I'm sure it's fine to talk about it now. Anyway, he cut this uh, whole thing in half with one of these, and oh, that's pretty cool. And they went through a bunch of them. This was his favorite. So I bought the exact same thing that he had, and I got the exact same results. That's it. Oh, and true story, <laughs> he didn't use a guard either, because a guard inhibited you from being able to see what you're doing to do accurate good work. When you're cutting tens of thousand dollars truck in half, you have to get it right. And the other thing is, is that he had his little box that it was kept in saying, no one use this except for Chaz, that's his name. Uh, he's the knife sharpening guy. This is his website right here, a little shout out to Chaz. I learned a lot of cool things about welding, grinding, cutting, metal stuff from him. And he's learned a lot of cool, I hope he's learned a lot of cool things about cars from me. I've answered a few questions back in the day. Way cool guy, way stand up guy. A shout out to you. Hopefully you'll see this. Chaz, you're the man. Here's some close up visuals of what the disc looked like when they break. 
Here you can see the primary ingredients are some kind of mesh, resin, and an abrasive. Well, I don't know exactly what the mesh is made of. It looks kind of like fiberglass, maybe. A post-mortem on the bolt and bushing shows very little rust at the bottom where the thing fell out. The top where the threads were reveals a significant amount of rust and impaction where this thing is just really, really tight. Looking at the rubber portion of the control arm bushing, you can see that there's a lot of surface cracking, which is indicative of drying, age, dry rot. If you look at the side wall of an old tire sitting in a junkyard or a field, you'll see these same kind of cracks. A quick look at the other wheel reveals that the strands are different. They're oriented more tight and uh, you can see that it fared a lot better against kickback. So this bottom side has less rust, this has more rust, so I'm going to hit it from the less rust side and see if we can get this thing to knock down and through. Not even a little bit. Let's try with less surface area and a little better grip. One hit and I got that to go through. Have a look. So here you can see there's a significant amount of rust. There wasn't any room left. You see where it tore and it actually sticks out further from where it was. You can't even stick that back through at all. There's just not any room for it. So rather than torching it and working and working and working, that's why we opt to cut it. This is the part that we hit real good and hard that we couldn't get to come undone. See the level of rust is just extreme. We could have tried cutting this way and opening it up. It's just the access is an issue. This way we can cut half of it on each like we did and then rotate it and cut the other half and that seemed to be a pretty good way to go. The only thing I really do not like about this particular method is the danger factor of it. Anytime you have something like this blow up in your face is not a good thing. But bear in mind you're in harm's way if you're right here to it. It'll come right at you. Camera got kind of ruined from it. I'll show a picture right here. You don't want to be on the same plane as the cutting blade. You want to have it off to an angle to where you can see what you're doing, do a good job that way. And then as far as the kickback, if something's spinning this direction, it's going to kick back this way. If something's spinning this direction, it's going to kick this way. It's like 45 degrees to whatever it is. That's been my experience. Uh, if you've got something else to say or you've got more advice, please feel free to leave it in the comments. I'm going to read through the comments. I'll put hearts. If somebody does something that's just really earth-shattering awesome, I pin it to the top. To get the new control arm in, you just tap in the bushing where it needs to be. If we didn't learn anything else from this video, it's that it's important to use anti-seize. So that's what you see happening here. Eating an elephant is best done one bite at a time. Same thing here. So I just position this. It's not together at the ball joint. But this way it's really easy to get the bolt to line up. Then I'll get the impact and send it home. This front bushing, because of its vertical orientation, can be tightened all the way down now. The other one requires some order of operation. The bolt for the rear bushing, we're going to do the same thing with the anti-seize. Using a pry bar, I'll position the control arm to where it'll just slide in. We'll come back to that here in a minute. I'll send it in with the impact, but I don't want to bind on that center part of it. There are four things that connect to this control arm, front and rear bushings, the stabilizer link, and the ball joint. At this time we'll do the ball joint. you got to be careful of the boot. Don't be rough on it like I was. What I was doing is I was trying to get the CV axle to collapse on there. The boot's already bad as you can see, and we'll have to revisit that later. At this point we're trying to do a job that has already grown in scope to a ridiculous degree. The ball joint's still tight, so we're going to run it for now. I'll tighten the nut on by hand to ensure that I don't cross thread it and then I'll follow up with an impact and get it snugged up. If you go too tight you can snap the tapered part. I'll put the pin in. This prevents it vibrating out. And then we're on to the fourth thing, the stabilizer link. This is a sway bar end link, stabilizer link, same family. This thing is a ball and socket type joint and so if I tighten it with the wrench everything moves. So we've got this Allen wrench that goes in the center. I'll set that to tighten and then I'm kind of going, or no, to loosen to hold it in place. And then I tighten it down with a gear wrench. You can see that I'm advancing on it. I always like to do these wet and lubricated, especially if they're used because that rust can really bind into things. So holding it in place, I'll crank it down. I've got my ratchet so that it's ground against the side so that I can really torque it. But the disadvantage of that is it gets stuck. You can pry it off if it comes apart or not. Uh, if it comes apart, no big deal, you can put it back in. Uh, otherwise, it often comes out whole. What we're seeing now is I've got this jacked up to where it's pretty much level. I'm gonna get it jacked up a little further until it starts to lift off of the lift on this corner. And that's just about dead level. 
that's the way the car sits when it's sitting on the ground. You want to align a car so that it is aligned for when it's sitting on the ground. It doesn't do you any good if the wheels are straight when it's on the left and funky when it's not. I'm going to go in with an extension and we're going to tighten this bolt back here. So the rubber that's in the bushing on this when it goes up and down is going to be assisting in the torque. It works kind of like a rubber spring and it affects your alignment. That's why we're doing all this fuss. So everything is tightened down. It's in the same position as it would be as if it were sitting on the ground with the weight of the car on the tires and ground and whatnot. So I'm going to loosen this up. And you're going to watch that tip back down. If we were to tighten it down when it was hanging down to begin with and then put it together, it would pull downward to it want to be at that position again and it would make this side ride too high. So that's why we do the things that we do so that the car will ride in better alignment. That's common practice. You talk to any front end technician, they'll tell you to tighten them down on the alignment rack. And if you've got a funky alignment or something sitting funny and whatnot, um, look and see if the struts match. If you've got a bad strut on one side, it'll cause it to sit funny. If you've got different brand struts or a new one and an old one, it'll make it sit funny. That's why you replace struts per axle per pair or pair per axle, you get the idea. And that's why you tighten things down in this fashion. I nicked it right here. We don't want rust to start there and weaken this. So we're just going to paint it. So this got a little banged up, got a little scratch here, scratch there. Perfect. Uh, this is engine ceramic paint. It withstands up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. So all the brakes and the engine heat or whatever, it's not going to hurt anything. This one's done. It's time to put this cover back on. Because we used the tool that we did, we're going to be able to put this back together a lot easier because these aren't torn to crap. Whenever I work on something, aside from having a new pretty part in place, I try to make it look like no one's ever been there. You didn't see anything. The goal of a good factory mechanic is to get everything back factory again. And that way, you don't have all kinds of issues or hiccups or problems. Everything's back to stock. Ta-da! To do that, you have to have the right techniques and the right tools. After all, what makes a good mechanic a good mechanic is, you know, like the Hippocratic Oath for doctors, do no harm. Don't screw the car up when you're trying to fix it. There are diminishing returns in some regard as far as that's concerned. You know, it's just like I cut the crap out of this thing. This car's old, but it's still good engineering. It's still good materials. It's still a good car. It's got brand new tires on it. It's going to have a good, it's got a good motor mount now, and it's got a good control arm. So this car is going to be a whole lot better off than it was. Just because it's old doesn't mean it can't drive nice. Star pattern. Bonus footage at the end.